Hey guys, I'm back with yet another computer video. I hope you guys like watching these as much as I like making them because they're quite enjoyable. I mean, I usually don't have time to go over uh, the computers I built, but since this one's special, uh, that means it belongs to me. I built it for myself. Uh, it's basically my land rig. As you guys know, I do uh, work for a living. I build computers. I have a computer shop, so I uh, do usually have readily uh, have access to uh, you know computer components quite readily. But obviously, I pay for them. It's not like uh, they come uh, out of nowhere for free. But anyways, going off topic. <laughs> So, this, I'm going to give you guys five seconds to guess what case it is. Most of you already have. Okay, it's an NZXT Vulcan. Uh, it's a micro ATX chassis, and it's one of my favorite micro ATX cases that I've ever been built. Mainly because of that sexy little handle up there. As I mentioned previously, it's a land rig, and I wanted it to be portable and uh, there are very few cases that come equipped with handles or uh, there are a few but most of them are too big too heavy and this one was just the right size for me to cram as much hardware as I possibly could inside so uh, yeah I know you guys are pretty anxious for me to open it and go over the hardware so let's do that looks nice and clean doesn't it well apart from that little bit of uh, white tubing on the right that's uh, because it's being pushed out by the, po the power supply cables the one for the graphic card so yeah there's not much could have been done I could have shoved the cables in but they keep coming back so there it is neat and tidy is what I'd like to call it so I guess let's go over the components uh, quickly Okay, the motherboard, uh, it's Haswell, LG1150, it's from Asus, and obviously it's a Z87 chipset called the Griffin. I could have just said Z87, Asus Z87 Griffin, but yeah, that was, uh, was more dramatic. The processor is a, or N, i7, 4770K, overclocked to an unknown number, I'll go over that later, all the numbers and extra bits later in the video. The graphics cards are a pair of MSI GeForce GTX 770 Gaming. Yes, it's basically a rebadged uh, GTX 680 with slightly higher uh, clocking memory or significantly, it's about 15% faster on stock. But, anyways, moving on, uh, the memory are a pair of Samsung, uh, 8 gigabytes, 2 times 4 gigabytes. Samsung 30 nanometer low profile, you know, they call them the Wonder RAM. And they're overclocked, everything in that system is overclocked. We'll go over the numbers later. Patience. The power supply, uh, AX, from Corsair obviously, AX760. I thought it was supposed to be called 760i. But yeah, that's the digital power supply from Corsair, you know, 80 plus platinum. Super power supply, no coil wind fan barely makes any noise. It's perfect. Uh, primary storage. Uh, let's see what we have. Oh yeah, it's a uh, OCZ. Yep, yeah. OCZ Vertex 4, 128 gigabytes. You know, it's not the top of the line, the highest end out there. But uh, well, when it was launched, it was amongst the like top three, top four uh, SSDs in terms of performance. It's still very good today. It's very good. We're, we're talking about 450 megabytes per second sequential read and write, and a lot of IOPS. It still will perform pretty well. Enough room for the operating system uh, and uh, my games. Speaking of operating systems, obviously Windows 7 Ultimate, 64 bits. What else would I use? Eight? No. Probably not yet. It's still got some issues to solve, so I'm not going with Windows 8 yet. Anyway, the pro secondary storage, or well, the mechanical storage, I should say, is a single uh, Hitachi 4 terabyte uh, hard drive. And yeah, that's basically, I just wanted the most amount of space I could get out of, because I can only fit a single 3.5 uh, inch hard drives in there 
you can see why because of the radiators on the right side and uh, that should tell you there's barely any space the SSDs, uh, the SSD is uh, attached to the back of the motherboard by some sticky tape really ghetto but it works it's perfect doesn't have any movie parts don't have to worry about that and uh, yeah the case as I mentioned before NZXT or NZXT Vulcan micro ATX now those are the main physical well main components uh, you know the electrical components fans uh, you can only see two or three fans here uh, the two on the right sides you guess that they're Corsair yes, uh, Corsair's uh, airflow or uh, static pressure sorry uh, series fans well the thing is they look exactly the same the airflow and the static pressure from the side so yeah they're uh, SP120 quiet edition they're rated for 1450 RPM they move a decent amount of air especially you know when there's a lot of restrictions uh, or restriction I'm using six of them that radiator on the right side and we'll get to the water cooling part separately hold on hold on there are four of them on that radiator and some push-pull and on the top there are also two more I'll show you when I get closer I don't want to detach the camera right now and uh, give you guys an aneurysm or something because it uh, shakes a lot and uh, right now yeah, so six Corsair SP120 Quiet Editions, and on that tiny little radiator on the left, we have uh, the uh, yeah, it's a 92 millimeter radiator. Obviously, it's a small chassis, so 120 millimeter was out of the question. So it's 92. Sorry, did I say 120 millimeter the first time? I'm a 92 millimeter radiator. Uh, it's using the Cooler Master Blade Masters. Uh, PWM fans. Uh, they're rated for 2400 RPM. They can get quite noisy at full speed, but uh, you kind of need the airflow. I mean, the, the processor and two graphics cards are being cooled, water cooled, and uh, I needed as much uh, punch as possible. Although the argument can be made that uh, since that case has integrated fan controllers, I should have used something a bit more powerful on the primary radiators. I mean, when you get fan controller, uh, noise is. Uh, not as big as an issue since you can adjust them but again it all depends on the fans uh, yeah in hindsight uh, the temperatures get a little bit warm as you can tell everything's overclocked and uh, over volted so the loop gets quite warm uh, I'm probably going to have to replace those fans uh, well I should mention that the only program application or slash games that uh, have a problem with is crisis 3 that thing uh, uses the CPU and GPUs like nothing else uh, to give you an example which no I shouldn't do it no, no this is for the later part of the video You're keeping the numbers there anyway yeah I'm probably gonna have to replace the fans I might get something uh, like the uh, SP120 performance or high performance edition those are rated for much higher RPM the high performance editions are rated for a thousand more RPM so it sits at 2450 I might replace that with it later since it gets quite hot it's just one title though okay so that's about it oh there's also another fan which uh, this one this is a scythe uh, I've forgotten what it's called but it's their tiny 12 millimeter thick fan you can see it's quite uh, thin and the reason I had to use this is because this little thing that I'm poking the side panel with. Uh, oh, whoops! Uh, the, that little thing blocks the uh, side panel wall quite well. Or, well, quite well. Maybe not the wrong, wrong word for it, but uh, it blocks it. So uh, I couldn't use a typical 25 millimeter thick uh, fan in there. So I had to go with the thinner one, and it's set to exhaust. So. Uh, the four fan, the, the intakes are only the four fans of the front that are on the main radiator, and the rest of the fans are set to exhaust. That includes the two top fans, the one at the back, and uh, the one on the side. So yeah, total of eight fans controllable. Only six of them are hooked up to the fan control uh, controllers. Uh, controller. There's two channels, but yeah. Uh, but th that's enough really. Oh, only the SP120s are hooked up to the fan controllers six of them total 
repeating myself again. Okay, uh, so that's about it. Now let me open up the front panel and show you guys what I've done in order to uh, fit that huge radiator in it. Looks good, doesn't it? If I do say so myself. Uh, at the top, you can see the 4 terabyte hard drive. Underneath that is the main radiator, which is a 240 millimeter XSPC RX240, sandwiched between in between uh, a pair, two pairs of Corsair SP120s. And that's a lot of information in a short amount of time. Anyways, as you guys may or may not know, uh, the NZXT Vulcan can only accommodate one single 120 millimeter fan uh, at the front panel so uh, what I had to do is uh, had to mod the case and cut uh, another fan hole on top of the first one well the first one had a lot of hexagonal mesh I had to cut that out to improve airflow and unify the front of the, fa uh, the case it came out uh, with a lot of jaggedy edges I sanded them down if you guys have ever done modding uh, I'm not a real modder but I bought some tools just for this project, like a Dremel and a Jigsaw. They worked out quite well. You basically use a Dremel to create an incision point, and then put the Jigsaw in there and cut out the uh, holes. Uh, there are a lot of modding guides on the internet. I'm not going to go too much into details. So yeah, by cutting those uh, two pieces out, uh, or the front panel, the metal bit out, um, it created enough room to fit another uh, 120 mm. 120 millimeter fan on top and consequently uh, managed to fit that fat uh, thick 240 red in there so I'm, I'm uh, it was like kind of my first major mod I've ever done on a case so uh, I was pretty happy with that now I should mention that there was a hard drive cage or a three and a half inch cage uh, underneath uh, right where the uh, top 120 millimeter fan is it was riveted to the case so I had to de-rivet it with the Dremel they were using pop rivets I uh, pop rivets all around the case so when the, the major pa panels are connected like the front panel the middle bit it was obviously riveted to uh, the bottom and top portions of the case as well so I de-riveted those then de-riveted uh, the, the drive cage and cut out a massive plate that was right between uh, uh, the sides of the case that were connecting the two sides. Uh, so by doing that, obviously I sacrificed a lot of rigidity, but that's where the mechanical hard drive uh, comes into pictures because uh, I used a uh, three and a half inch to five and a quarter inch uh, adapter, and it's a big piece of metal and it's quite rigid. So what I did uh, is put the hard drive on them. Obviously, I needed a place for a mechanical hard drive, so that was a perfect place and uh, by attaching those it basically uh, with four screws it attaches to both sides of the case left and right and uh, it uh, it has a lot of rigidity to the case um, before that it was a little bit wobbly by putting that in there it's perfect now uh, airflow uh, the, the right bit uh, you're looking at uh, the plastic bit is obviously the front shroud and uh, it's it has a lot of mesh in it and it's dust filtered so it was perfect like uh, the airflow in that and that uh, portion is uh, pretty epic actually um, so much so that uh, even though I got like four exhaust fans and only uh, like I do have four four uh, fans sucking in uh, air but you only have these two at the front side so uh, I'm still I still managed to keep uh, positive air pressure since uh, there's just so much airflow in there and because of that, I didn't get a whole lot of dust in there even after operating the case in like a really dusty environment for about a week. Everything, all the dust was just accumulating in the, in the front of the case. So that was a really uh, cool feature. I also didn't tie down all the front cables completely or extend them a little bit so I could uh, take the front panel uh, off and uh, show you guys what's uh, beneath that. And uh, yeah, that's about it. A lot of talk just. Uh, about the front panel. Uh, all right, let's go to the inside of the case, and I'll show you all the water cooling bits. As promised, we're going to go over the water cooling components. 
The main radiator, radiator as I just mentioned, it is a uh, XSPC RX240. It's a 63 millimeter thick radiator, so it's pretty beefy. It, it provides a uh, really uh, a good level of cooling performance, so I'm, I'm happy with that. The second radiator is a uh, Hardware Labs Black Ice GTX Gen 2 Extreme Micro 92. Heck of a long name, but it is what it is. I think it's uh, 45 or 50 millimeters thick, and it was the only option I could really use to uh, at the back of the at the back of the case. Uh, some people I've seen a lot of. Vulcan cases, uh, and uh, what they've done is basically uh, external water cooling. They've removed the top handle, as you can see there, and put a 240 external rad right on top. And uh, I didn't do that because that would defeat the purpose of the case. I wanted something portable that I could just carry around with one hand and not have to worry about anything else. So, to me, the proper way to go about it was to. Uh, you know, I put the 240 in front of the case and uh, a 92 at the back. That's as pretty much as max maxed out the cooling solution uh, for this case, as far as internal water cooling is concerned. Obviously, external we can get a bit more creative, but I love the dimension of this case. Very compact and portable, as I've mentioned many many times. Now, the CPU water block is sadly missing. Danger Dan M6, and uh, if you guys know, or maybe you don't know, but Danger Dan gone out of business about six to six months to be about a year ago. I don't exactly remember. I bought a couple of these just before they went out, and uh, really cool, uh, uh, really cool company, a private company. Like only had a couple of uh, people working in there, but unfortunately, I think there was a death in the family, and they had to close shops and move on. But uh, yeah, sad to see them go. But I uh, used that particular uh, CPU cooler in there it's uh, it's a very heavy piece of uh, piece of copper and uh, it actually doesn't have a back plate but I didn't find that to be a problem you basically use plastic washers at the back to mount the um, uh, to mount it in and uh, there's some springs in the in there that stops you from over torquing it so it uh, actually didn't bend the motherboard I thought it would do that or damage it but uh, it's perfectly works uh, works perfectly fine now uh, the GPU blocks I used two of these these are where is it okay so these are EK VGA supremacy bridge edition now these are universal uh, universal block for GPUs the reason why I chose those is because uh, when I bought the cards uh, GTX uh, MSR GTX 770 gaming uh, since they're non-referenced, there were no full uh, water block available for them, and to this, to this date, end of August, it still August 2013, it still isn't. So uh, I just seized the initiative and bought some universal blocks. Uh, now I'll explain the pros and cons of that, but uh, we're going we're going over the parts. So let's keep it the, that way. Now I, the supremacy ones, I bought the bridge edition because obviously the bridge edition is for uh, you know, when you want to use uh, more than one card, it's very useful there because you can use uh, something like this. This is the EKFC Bridge Dual Parallel CSQ. What it does is basically connects those two water blocks together in a uh, in a parallel fashion. So uh, water goes through them both uh, both blocks simultaneously. Uh, it's best for both. Uh, uh, it's best for. Uh, it doesn't make much of a difference, parallel or serial, unless we're talking like four GPUs. Uh, but yeah, that's what uh, connects those two and uh, unifies them basically. As rigidity too, which uh, it's quite nice. The pump I use basically I use the cheapest thing I could find at the time, which isn't to say it's a bad thing. Uh, it's a Lang DDC One T. It's basically a DDC pump. I think it's rated for. Uh, you see the specs at the back. Uh, it's rated for I think 420 liters per hour, which is okay. Nothing too, nothing too fancy. To put that in perspective, the much beloved uh, MCP uh, 655 moves 1,200 liters per hour. Obviously, with that 655, you get a lot more pressure too. So 
the, the loop is pretty simple and uh, uh, the cable runs are very short so I didn't encounter any uh, abnormality really so this was uh, this was a decent find I mainly uh, uh, bought that pump well DDC used the DDC pump because of the size efficiency uh, it's not too loud which is uh, weird because uh, DDC pumps usually are and the reservoir, which is a uh, top-mounted reservoir, uh, reservoir, reservoir. Yeah, I know I got a funny accent. Don't laugh at me. Or laugh at me. Okay, so uh, use this uh, XSPC uh, uh, acrylic reservoir for lating uh, or laying DDC. So uh, it's basically. Uh, Again, this was kind of like the cheapest thing I could find, and uh, not the cheapest. There were a couple of. It's not like cheapest is worse. It's it's a standard reservoir with uh, a couple of different, uh, you know, uh, uh, a couple of different uh, holes at the different sides, so you can use either of them for uh, entry or exit or intake. Or what do they call them? Damn, it's, it's seven in the morning. I'm very tired. <laughs> Uh, whatever you guys know what I'm talking about and so yeah I used that and it barely just clears the second graphic card so it was a really tight fit <sighs> okay so those are the main components obviously I used the uh, tubings and fittings and whatnot I used the uh, uh, Enzotech compression fittings and compression 90 degree compression fittings from Enzotech uh, throughout the whole belt uh, they look quite nice and uh, I've been using them for a while. Uh, compression fittings are pretty much all the same. Uh, they're pretty safe and they look nice. That's why you use them. A bit more expensive than simple barbs. But uh, yeah, I guess uh, it's worth the price premium. And other than that, you can see this is the most interesting part of the loop. And uh, it took a lot of uh, trial and error to get it. This little connection here. So uh, let's go over the loop order first, then I'll go over that and see uh, what uh, why I've done what I've done. So the pump at the bottom uh, goes all the way up uh, to the main radiator, then goes uh, from there to the CPU block, from there it goes to the secondary radiator. Radiator. I'm, I'm really parched. Apologies. <laughs> goes to the second radiator and then goes to the GPU blocks. After that, the loop uh, goes back to the pump slash reservoir and the loop repeats. Now, this little bit is quite interesting. The mo the margins uh, building this thing is just unbelievable since I basically filled this case to the brim. As you can see, there's not a whole lot of space left for anything. Like maybe you could snuck an SSD here and there at the back, but that's about it. Uh, so, uh, as you can see, the reservoir just barely clears the uh, second graphic card as I mentioned before and what I did I used three 90 degree uh, uh, fittings to and a uh, three 90 degree fitting plus a SLI fitting in order to uh, hook up the graphic cards and uh, the reservoir together so I'm quite proud of that so yeah 190, 290, 390 and then the straight one it's adjustable so uh, it's uh, it was a, it was an absolute mission to get in there. I pro I promise you, it just took just a lot of planning and uh, a lot of uh, cocaine and uh, yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, moving on. Yeah. Uh, the uh, obviously <laughs> uh, you can fill the reservoir if you feel like uh, you know you don't have enough uh, liquid in there. Uh, the top. Uh, uh, the little hatch on top is uh, accessible. You just have to unplug the bottom uh, graphic card in order to um, not unplug, but remove the power uh, power cables uh, in order to uh, access that. And uh, that's about pretty much everything. Now, uh, I quite like the Corsair power supply. I found a good deal on it. I, th I think I uh, let me zoom out. Rookie mistake. I paid about uh, $130 before tax and shipping for that power supply, which is pretty good for 80 plus platinum power supply. Exceptional, really. Uh, I mean, the cool thing about it is uh, I'm not really a silent freak. I don't care much about noise, but 
I did use, uh, I mean, with the in internal uh, integrated fan controller and water cooling and with that superb power supply, like, idle, you can't hear nothing, basically, you can't hear anything, and uh, even at load, it's pretty quiet, unless I ramp the uh, fans up to give me some better cooling during some heavy gaming sessions, but even benchmarking uh, doesn't get too warm. We'll go over the numbers in a little bit, uh, in a little bit, so, uh, what else, uh, okay, the graphic card, that's uh, the cool part I kind of did, uh, I should say, uh, if you can see, see those heat sinks, I've used about 20 of them per card, now, here's the funny bit, I've explained why, uh, I use the bridge edition uh, CPU, universal uh, GPU block. Uh, to water cool the graphic cards. Obviously there were no full water block available for them so I had to improvise. Now the cool thing about that MSI uh, six, uh, 770 gaming is that it came with a bra bracing plate that uh, you know uh, stops the card from sagging and also the same uh, plate cools both the VRM and uh, the memory chips so th that, was, uh, that was a pretty cool feature they included Obviously, it uh, requires direct airflow to keep cool, and those SP120s at the front just weren't providing enough airflow. So that's why I fitted the side 120 exhaust, as, as you guys saw in the first part of the video. Even that wasn't enough because uh, it wasn't direct airflow. So what I did is I picked up uh, about 20 of those little heat sinks that you can buy on eBay for like five bucks for eight of them. Uh, therefore, the copper heat sinks you use them for cooling memory chips and stuff like that. Uh, pretty basic stuff uh, they uh, yeah so I used 20 of them on uh, 20 on each of them and uh, they, they they actually uh, improved the cooling quite significantly uh, to the point that I managed to get 200 megahertz extra uh, extra out of uh, the memory clock and about 12 to 25 megahertz extra out of the core clock so they actually did play a massive role now I'm about to run out of memory space so I got a uh, cut it at this point and then I'll come back with whatever's left to talk about okay guys uh, sorry I'm back <laughs> I ran out of uh, memory so uh, yeah as I was saying just, just the camera a little bit yeah those extra heat sink actually do make a difference uh, you may ask why well obviously uh, you could uh, correlate to the fact that you know the cooler the memory runs the faster you can clock it so obviously that helps but the other thing is, uh, you ask, why would it increase the core clock, uh, you know, why would it help w why, uh, with increasing the core clock? And the reason is the VRMs or voltage regulator modules are uh, a critical part of the whole PCB. So what they do is basically uh, regulate the voltage to different parts of the, you know, the graphic cards or the motherboard, depending on which, uh, which one they're on. So the cooler they run, the more efficient they will be and more overhang they'll have. So obviously adding those extra copper heat sinks, increasing the surface area, incre increasing or uh, improving cooling, uh, it uh, it helped out in that sense. Now I'll tell you a little uh, story, it's kind of related to the same thing. I had a GTS 250 uh, a long time ago and uh, this was like the Galaxy version that was low profile. That had exposed VRMs at the back. At the time, I could only uh, it was it came out of the box 600 megahertz clo uh, core clock and managed to push it to 680 on modified. But I noticed that the VRMs were getting scorching hot, so I added uh, a lot of little uh, copper heat sinks to it and I managed to crank the uh, core clock all the way up to 730 megahertz, which uh, which astounded me really. So it does work keeping your VRM cool does help with the efficiency of the car and does help you push the clogs just a little bit more so keep that in mind uh, okay now on the left side I forgot to mention this you see two little SLI bridges uh, obviously people that have done SLI know that you only need one of them and I just put the second one in there because you know it kind of looks cool and uh, it complements the other one so just for aesthetics I uh, had a extra PCI cable laying around so I used that. Incidentally I got those SLI cables from uh, uh, from uh, MSI motherboards and I'm using it on those uh, on those MSI graphics cards so 
positive karma there. <laughs> All right, so I think uh, that's about everything. Well, let's take a closer look. Let me just take you off the tripod and uh, let's go for a closer look. Cause what's the point? Uh, if, you know, I've seen through all. Uh, uh, I've sat through all of this and and get a closer look. So be back. Okay guys, we're in here nice and personal, so, well we can go over the loop uh, one more time, you know, uh, just in case you've missed it, or, you know, now for a better view, here's the pump and rest combo, and uh, I've used a little bit, uh, I think it's a uh, three quarter inch straight fittings, it's basically an extension that I used in order to attach the 90 degree compression fitting. So we go all the way up there to another 90 degree fitting and then we go, let me see if, oh yeah, I've used another extension back there, I'm sorry you guys can see it, I've uh, I also ran out of battery when I was uh, filming and it's connected to a cable so we can't really go in there. Uh, okay, anyway, so yeah, and from the radiator goes back with the normal straight fitting, I mean uh, a compressor fitting, uh, go to the CPU block and the CPU block, I'm not sure if there's enough light, and I've used another 90 degree just to keep the, just to keep the, uh, the tubing nice and straight, and I used another uh, extender to connect the, to the water block. After that, I uh, used the single simple compression fittings to go to another, yet another 90 degree compression fittings into yet another extension. And coming back here, used a 90 degree, yet again, to a straight fitting or a compression fitting. And after that, used three little 90 degree fittings to hook the graphic card to the reservoir. And that there's also it's adjustable, so that's uh, as you can see that's a uh, uh, SLI fitting. Okay, that's about it. I'm really having a hard time getting my words out. I'm very tired, as I always am when I make videos, because it's usually very late or very early, because I don't have a lot of time. Uh, but I do try to t get these out as uh, soon as possible. One other thing you might have noticed is that that uh, that side panel. Uh, sidewall is a little bit damaged and that's because it got bent and uh, basically put too much pressure on it then it got bent so I had to unbend it by uh, hammering it a little bit and using pliers so it's not the best job in the world the side panel have a little bit of a problem hooking up but that's fine it goes in uh, and out with uh, relative ease and this little uh, last bit I should mention probably is uh, an extension that I used to hook up the side panel fan to the motherboard obviously I could have uh, hooked it up directly to the motherboard but since I'm going to be taking it off uh, on and off the side panel uh, quite often I thought I might as well add an extension because it's really difficult to get your hands in there and uh, attach the fan cable this was a little bit of practicality other than that I think we're pretty much finished now I'll take you guys back to the to well uh, to the operating system and show you all the clocks and settings and goodies and whatnot. Now to take a look at the settings and configurations that I've used with this system, you know, the stuff like the overclock, the voltages, temperatures, etc. <laughs> I just noticed that my driver, NVIDIA drivers are out of date and so is the MSI Afterburner, so, you know, I'll update them after the video, it's no big deal. Just wanted to point that out. Uh, let's start with the processor. As you can see, it's an uh, Intel Core i7 4770K running at 4.7 gigahertz and using 1.4 volts. Now, I, what I didn't mention in the video is that my processor is deleted. By that I mean I uh, replaced the internal uh, uh, thermal paste between the die and the IHS, that's integrated heat threader, with something much better which is a uh, therm which is cool laboratory liquid pro obviously you know this voids the warranty but uh, grants me additional headroom to overclock and push it a little bit further 
Uh, it's a kind of a controversial topic, really, because uh, I investigated this with both Ivy Bridge and Haswell, and uh, proved that the poor temperatures that are uh, the, the chips are suffering from are not just because you know the die shrink. It's mainly because Intel decided to, with all their wisdom and experience, to use crappy thermal interface between die and the IHS, and uh, resulting in this, the overheating issue. So typically you can't really push the Haswell processors anything, you can't feed them anything more than 1.3 volts, even if you have the best water cooling setup, because they'll just, uh, they'll, uh, thermal throttling will kick in and uh, all your efforts will be in vain. Anyway, so I deleted this and uh, pushed it to 1.4 volts. Obviously, uh, it's a bit of a big unknown with these chips and how much voltage you should feed them 24/7 uh, in order to to uh, have sustained stability over a long period of time. So that's how much I feel comfortable with. I mean, uh, to get for 4.8 gigahertz, you need about 1.46 volts, which is a lot and I'm not willing to feed my chip that much obviously this chip is below average let's say I've seen process I've seen uh, processors that can do or Haswell chips that can do 4.8 gigahertz with only 1.25 volts so uh, this is by no mean a cherry a cherry chip it's not a unicorn <laughs> so anyways uh, that's about that and uh, some of you may know or some of you may not that uh, Haswell also have something called the ring or cache frequency and it's basically what we used to have uh, with the uh, stuff like 1360 socket 1366 processors uh, it's on core basically so it doesn't attribute much to performance but it can help that just a little bit uh, if you want to eke every single uh, bit of performance out of it every s single bit <laughs> every little bit of performance out of it so northbound frequency, which is the ring voltage, if it starts to focus, uh, it's 4.5 gigahertz, which is 200 megahertz less than the actual uh, core voltage. I found that to be pretty nominal. It uh, helps in the benchmarks a tiny little bit, so I wasn't really keen on giving uh, the ring too much voltage. Uh, well, since we're here, we can go over the memory. It's running at 2200 megahertz uh, frequency, uh, running 9, 10, 11, and 14 timings, which is pretty outstanding for... 2200 megahertz. Uh, it's the Samsung Wonder RAM 30 nanometer low profile DDR3 kit, 8 gigabytes, and it's it's been in the market for over a year now, and it's well known for its overclocking capability. I don't know if they're still in production, but uh, you know I bought two kits back when they came out, and they've served me very well. Uh, they uh, out of the box they run at 1600 megahertz with 11, 11, 11, 35 timings, but obviously. I fed them more voltage. Uh, the stock voltage is 1.35 volts. I'm feeding them 1.6 volts to get to 2200 megahertz with those really tight timings. So, uh, there it is. Uh, temperatures. At idle, you can see it's running around the 28, 29, 30 degrees on average. Uh, and yeah, I'm pretty happy with those just for. Uh, a quick little demonstration and how well the thermals are. I'm going to run Prime 95. Uh, this is the latest variation, which is not really recommended to run with these processors. But uh, I'm just going to give it a quick boost to see uh, how well the temperatures will cope. Obviously, I don't recommend running Prime 95 mainly because although I've uh, in pretty much every task it uses 1.4 volts in Prime 95 it'll shoot all the way to like 1.5 volts which is really not recommended so even though it's, it will run at 1.5 volts uh, temperatures will be pretty much in check so I'm just gonna run large FFTs as you can see voltage shot up to 1.47 volts and the temperatures around 70 degrees it'll creep up slowly as the water in the loop heats up but uh, yeah that's pretty much it uh, even at 1.47 volts on the tiny loop I have, the temperatures are outstanding, literally outstanding. So I'm pretty happy with those. Okay, I'm gonna kill Prime 95 now before it degrades my chip. Okay, now the graphics card. So as I explained uh, earlier, I have a pair of GTX uh, 770s from MSI, the gaming edition cards. 
the mount of my camera is really hard. That's what she said. Anyway, you can see the GPU clock, uh, which is mentioned at uh, it is 1184 co uh, core and 1236 uh, boost, and those aren't quite accurate as under pretty much every game. I hit 1306 megahertz. That's right, thir over 1300 megahertz on core on every game. Um, the power limit is obviously raised, and so is the voltages. So that's how much I could get out of it. The offset is 125. Obviously, you can't follow my settings because every card is different, and depending on your cooling, power supply, whatever game you might use, you know, you'll experience different clocks and set of parameters and whatnot. You should know by now. So yeah, 1306 megahertz and the memory, which is pretty impressive. Uh, if it 1950 megahertz, that's single channel, uh, and uh, if I manhandling the camera, I translate into 7.8 gigahertz of memory. Now the 770 is the main difference between 770 and the 680 is basically the memory that they use, the memory chips. They use Hynix chips for the 680s that were uh, standard at 6 gigahertz. Uh, for the 770 they use memory from Samsung which is uh, rated at 7 gigahertz so that's about 15 percent increase 17 percent increase over the previous one and it gives a lot of uh, memory bandwidth obviously I've pushed it uh, to 7.8 gigahertz which is 800 megahertz more and uh, as a result of that I'm getting almost 250 gigabit per second memory bandwidth which is terrific it's perfect it makes me very happy uh, and, uh, I should mention that obviously I wouldn't have been able to hit them uh, hit that high of a clock if uh, if I didn't mod the graphic card with extra heat sinks uh, on the you know the memory and whatnot. So something to think about. Yeah, memory clock press 394. Uh, that's about it, really. Uh, I don't really have uh, any benchmarking program installed because it's a fresh Windows install. Uh, so it's not really. Uh, I mean, you can Google 4770K benchmarks and SLI 770s, uh, but I can tell you that uh, Unigen Valley, uh, maxed out in 1080p or Extreme HD, I'm getting about 44 to 4500 uh, score, which is uh, uh, amazing. My old 680s used to get about 3400, but they were running at lower clocks, obviously, because they were reference and, uh, you know, they were s slower. Uh, 680s were running at like 1215 megahertz, 6500 memory. This obviously runs a lot higher frequency, especially on the memory. So uh, there it is, guys. Uh, uh, before I forget, I should mention that I used distilled water for as a coolant, and uh, I added uh, antifreeze to the loop. Um, and, uh, don't be shocked or anything, but antifreeze is uh, the perfect biocide and at the same time it acts as an anti-corrosive agent so uh, it's per it's it's the only thing you need to add the uh, distilled water really to get uh, you know both uh, you know uh, not get rust or uh, corrosion inside your loop which can cl clog up and cause problems restrictions uh, and also kills algae and bacteria so you know your loop stays clean for far longer Okay, I think I've rambled enough for far too long, and I'm gonna cut the video here. Have I missed something? I think it was pretty much very in depth, uh, uh, as far as I can tell. Uh, motherboard, graphic card, yeah, went over everything. So uh, this is me, Cyclops slash Hostel, and I might come back at you with yet another one of these videos if I get enough traction on this, see how much people like it. If they like my rambling, if they hate it, if they think I'm gay, and I should uh, cut myself or something. But, you know, I enjoy doing it, then I'll probably will. Uh, the reception will help, obviously. I'll see you guys in the next one. Peace. As with every video I make, <laughs> I usually forget something and remember it right after I press the stop button. So in this case, I forgot to talk about the graphic card temperatures. As you can see, the idle temperatures are pretty good, 26 degrees for both cards. I think that it was like a 27. Let's let's check the other one. Uh, um, same same type, 27. Yeah, oh, is right, 26. Whatever. It's the same. Uh, it's the same thing, really.
and under load uh, in like something like uh, Unigine Valley to get to about 45 degrees with ma fans at uh, about maximum so pretty good temperatures uh, considering the loop is quite small and I'm using uh, low RPM relatively speaking low RPM fans so there's that and uh, uh, Crisis 3 is another story though it basically goes to 11 uh, regarding CPU and GPU utilization so the GPU temperatures jump all the way to like uh, 57 degrees so about uh, 10 degrees warmer than uh, like a normal just graphic benchmarks and uh, that's quite amazing it's a very taxing game and uh, I'm glad I built the loop as well as I did because uh, I needed the extra cooling now you might say 57 is a bit hot well it is it is a bit hot but uh, I'm probably gonna replace the fans for water cooling is a bit hot 57 I'm probably gonna, you're gonna replace the fans get something higher performance as I mentioned in the earlier part of the video and uh, I can always down clock them a little bit, which I don't really want to do because that's not what overclocking is about. It's pushing it to the limit in my uh, in my experience. And uh, to put that in, into perspective, come going back to the 57 degree uh, temperature, like uh, when you run these cards uh, uh, under you know their own steam with uh, air cooling, they hit about 70, 75 degrees usually these 770s if they have really good coolers they talk about 65 to 70 degrees and um, those are perfectly acceptable for air cooling the problem is uh, water cooling when you're talking about that high of a temperature it means that uh, the liquid inside the loop will warm up to a point that uh, in, you know the longevity will become questionable since uh, the o-ring and the uh, stuff that used in the loop uh, you know parts of the pump uh, they don't bode well with uh, high temperatures now 57 really isn't pushing it and you can't uh, it's kinda hard to put it in perspective because when you say 57 that's graphic card temperature not liquid temperature liquid temperature is gonna be a lot lower around 40 to 45 degrees still I like to keep it as cool as possible that's why the, f the new replacement fans will come in so okay this is the end and I'm gonna press the stop button. See you on the next one.